start to record this class. Okay, so we talk about constant interval using so-called pivotal quantity. I have been demonstrating the pivotal quantity is a very useful approach, which is really easy to implement. Okay, of course, we talk about inverting uh, accepted region, inverting the tests to become constant interval, but the the process of deriving the test is quite long. Of course, you might be able to jump directly to some tests and then proving that, for example, uh, I can use t test without any LRT based. Okay, what I'm saying is you, you, you can use your LRT to derive t test, but it's not really necessary to say, well, I have to go for LRT first. I can directly nail down, hey, this is a t test and this is this is the rejection region of a t-test, and then it's a separate region of t-test, then you convert it to the constant interval. Yeah, it's doable. Nothing wrong with that. And then, we uh, talk about period of quantity, and then see how, and see how easy that is to find the compass interval. Okay, so I end up saying that, Okay, this is a natural pivot called CDF. The reason for that called natural pivot is this. I said, well, I said, as long as S1 to Xn follow some PDF right here. And then if you apply the CDF function of every random variable, then it's going to follow uniform zero one. Okay? So you do need to know how to derive in that. How about you do it right now in an easy case? And you will see why it's the case. I, I'm not going to finish everything. So which means that it's, if you remember I say, what if y equals to f of x one, for example, right here. Right, the CDF of Y using the mass of CDF, okay, equals to what? Probability of F of X1 smaller than Y. Okay, then remember I said F, because F, of course, given F it's monotone increasing function, then you can feel free to apply in, in inverse function on both sides, and the side doesn't change, okay? By doing so, the whole thing is CDF. So the whole thing is F, 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 F inverse. F, F inverse, right here. Then become Y. Okay? So I mean, this guy, CDF, is Y. Only distribution, only distribution, whose CDF is Y. It's only what? Uniform zero one. It's so the proof is really not that difficult to say the CDF is uniform zero one. Okay. So because CDF is uniform zero one, that's independent of theta. That means naturally CDF is a pivot. Okay. Or CDF is a pivot of quantity. Okay. So Suppose that I do have any statistic t right here. Okay, if I do have, let me take out a bunch of things. I wanna go through again. Okay, so if I do have t is a statistic, and that, and then I also know that it's, I also can derive the CDF of t. Remember, it's CDF of t, not CDF of x1 to xn. Okay, so if CDF is a decreasing or increasing a function in theta, okay, so either way, but you will see more often than not, it's you do have decreasing function more often, as you can see, a common PDF down below show. Okay, either way decreasing or increasing function of theta. 
again, I want to emphasize, when I draw a graph, you have x, x axis, y axis. You do need to pay attention to what x axis is, which means that when I'm talking about function, function of what? Okay, you need to pay attention to that. Right here is a function of theta. So say if f is decreasing function of theta, then I can use in the pivot to find the confidence interval for theta using CDF. Okay, so the next time I said it, okay, it looks like it looks like the formula I write it here is quite complicated, but actually it's not. Okay, so how about I show it here? Have a bigger graph. Okay, so right here you have that CDF of the monotone decreasing function. Okay, so maybe we can look at example directly. Okay, let me see. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Not easy to take a bunch of. Okay. Good. Okay. So let's look at the example directly. You will know what I'm saying about monotone decreasing function of theta head. So I have in that example right here. Okay. So even right here. So if if x1 to xn, x1 dot 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 to xn right here is a PDF, follow some PDF. This PDF to me looks like a shifty exponential once, which means that it's if it's not shifted for if for example mu is zero, then that PDF itself is it is exponential one. Mu right bigger than theta. Let me see. Bigger than mu, smaller than theta. Okay, could be equal to it's fine. Okay. Good. Again, mu right here is shifted. Me right here is shifted. Uh, why can I not write something down? Okay, me right here is shifted. They also told you that it's mu is actually a location parameter. Okay, because it's shifting back and forth, that could give you different PDF. Okay, and later on, I will show you that it's hey. If you talk about its location parameters, there are some other quantity which could be periodic quantity as well. If you remember that, it's fine. We can go back to that later on. Good. So right now it's you look at mu here, and you might wonder what kind of statistics is good for mu. Okay. So hopefully you guys experience enough. You would guess what kind of mu. As bad as an estimator for your lower bound of x mu, which is what? x1. Okay, so you, will, you, be, you, you, you should be able to prove x1 is sufficient statistics, okay, using what theory? Okay, so the answer is the directional theory, right? Remember that? Okay, but you might not be able to prove that's a complete statistics, okay? It relying on some different skills to say so, but I won't give you that in the final, trying to show that other statistics is a complete statistics, okay? Good, so uh, minimum order statistics is a good estimation for me. And then based on training I have, I can also deriving x1's CDF using formula or X1 CDF. As you can see, it's in terms of order statistic, in terms of minimum one or maximum one, I don't need to use 
formula. I can basically what? Just deriving the CDF directly and then using the properties of other statistics, which means that it's, I can switch around basically say X1 is bigger than X, right? And then I'll claim that it's because of X1, because more is one bigger than X, then everyone is bigger than X. And then it would become like PX1 with power N right here. Okay. And then based on original distribution, I can I can derive the original uh the original spra built x1 build x basically survival function it's okay so then I think right here I'm guessing still e x x minus mu x okay then with power n okay that's original one survival function x and then let me see yeah and then it will become one minus exponential minus n, and then x minus mu. It's right here. Okay, so they are using y, so let me using y. So they'll be consistent with the final answer. It okay, so. Small and y, 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 y, then y x. Okay, fits what you have here. Of course, y still bigger than mu, small than infinity. Okay, then you look at this is CDF of x1. Okay, again, you will say that it's CDF distribution is uniform zero one okay so that means this is f of mu then this is x1 it's okay and then function of mu right here and then you look at this function okay this is function definitely an increasing function of y okay and you look at function of mu what does that tell you you do have minus term right here and the minus term right here become positive and, and then you have some minus term right here that means when and when you getting bigger you actually having smaller cdfs so that means that tells you that it, this is decreasing function of mu of, of course, again, it's not straight line. I'm just trying to say that the amount of the equation function, of course, it's exponential line right here. Okay. Good. And then, how do I using CDF as a pivot proper as a pivot properties to derive? Okay. So, which means that it's if you told me that somebody is a pivot, then I should be able to write here. Say this is right mu then x1 it's a pivot and then i should be able to find from quantile to quantile isn't it right like like we did to a pivotal quantity edge and then you told me that this guy follows uniform zero one if i know distribution of my pivotal quantity then it should be easy to find A and B, isn't it? Right? Because I do know this is, let me write it here, physical space right here. I do know you will uniform zero one here. And then say this is zero, this is one. Okay? Then this is my random variables. Oops. Then this is my random variables, CDF. This is my random variables, right? PDF. Okay, for me that is from A to B, from A to B, 
the right here. Okay, then we put B much more far side, wrong ones. So you know this is A, it's one, A to B right here. A to B. Okay, and you, you told me that it's, hey, this is A to, from A to B. Inside guy right here, it's as alpha. Okay, and then depending on what you wanna have in the others, left hand side and then right hand side it's. Okay, so normally we'll say left hand side it's alpha half, right hand side it's alpha half as well. Okay, that means in terms of probability, in terms of area, this is alpha and half, which tells you what? Tells you A should be alpha over two, right? Because the height right here is one, All right? And in the meantime, we told you that B right here is what? B right here equals one minus alpha over two it's because the right hand side probability also alpha over two. Okay, so I mean, because of uniform zero one, it could be easy to get you less. Alpha over two, then one minus alpha over two it's. Okay, good. And then, hold on. And then since you know that, you see the F method right here is what? One minus exponential minus N, then one minus mu it, right? That's your CDF. And then it's more than one minus alpha over two it right here, okay? So that also means that it's, you do, you do know that you have as a CDF from A point to B point, from alpha over two to one minus alpha over two right here. This is your A to B quantile to quantile in terms of people quality. Then because of marathon decreasing function, you could using that to solving for right here, mute in terms of lower bound and then upper bound of that domain, which is use 95% comes with interval, okay? So, which means that it's, I write it here, really just in a general way of talking about how you are going to find lower bound and upper bound, okay? For example, right here, I'm saying right here, I'm not necessarily use alpha over two, maybe pardon me on that, I'm using, should be using it's alpha one, alpha two. But make sure that which one is alpha one, which one is alpha two. Upper bound, up to, yeah, I think this is alpha one, this is alpha one, and then this is alpha two, one minus alpha two is, which also means that this guy alpha one, okay, maybe I should change everything to alpha one, alpha two, then alpha one minus alpha two x. Again, alpha one plus alpha two is alpha. Okay, so right here, really give you general, right here, really give you general approach. Told you that it's, if you want to find upper bound of you, okay, using what? Using alpha ones right here, because of their monotone decreasing function properties. Finding upper bound of mu using lower bound of the CDF, alpha one right here, okay? Then finding upper bound, find the upper bound of mu, I find lower bound of mu, Finding lower bound of mu using upper bound of the 
CDN. Okay, so the rest of that become like uh, equation solving. Okay, which means that I do know using upper bound, I do know using alpha one to solving for, but I do know using alpha one to solving for upper bound of mu. Okay, which means that it's right here. If you come back to right here, right here. Okay, so you're actually using that that hand side right here to solving for upper upper bound, and using the right hand side right here to find a lower bound, and then luckily in this example, you having that what you having doing direct algebra, just working on some operations. And then you will find out you can solve in for the problem, which means that it's you can actually put mu in the middle and then less one lower. Okay. So the way I say so is sorry, is this. Okay. So by doing that, I can move one to both ends. Right? So basically means that it's it's alpha minus one small than x minus exponential minus n then y minus mu is smaller than minus alpha two both ends minus one and then using the minus term right here on both ends by using minus you got to pay attention to because of minus is decreasing sense so you will upper bound become lower bound okay Minus n then y minus mu small than you will you will lower bound become upper bound right here one minus alpha over two right? and then you're taking log log alpha over two small than minus n y minus mu small than log one minus alpha over two x okay Again, you have that minus term right here. You apply on both ends. Again, keep in mind it's maybe no, I don't want to apply minus because eventually I have minus right here. Oh, I can change that become minus ny. Let me do that. So let me jump a little bit. Then minus ny, then plus and mu it. Okay. So that means eventually you move this guy here, you move this guy here, and then divide it by n. So eventually become y plus one over n log alpha over two, then smaller than mu, smaller than, uh, let me see, y, then also plus one over n, then log one minus alpha over two x. Okay? So that means by that direct operation, you do having you you could put mu in the middle, and then having your lower bound, and then upper bound at. Okay, so hands can find out ninety five percent of one minus alpha comes in the ball in this case using CDF. Okay, but do you every time having that as lucky as doing operation, you put your middle put mu in the middle. What I'm saying is, would you, would you get lucky every time? You could do that and then do the operation directly to put your mu in the middle. Not necessary, okay? So again, I want to say this is, even though it's, sometimes you may have in the case, you won't be able to do operation to put your mu in the middle. It's totally fine. Okay, imagine this is, like I said, it's, if you're solving for equation, okay, right here, even though you may not necessarily find exact solution, you might be able to use numerical approximations to find out which theta actually, which theta actually satisfy this equation. That, okay, I don't have the example for you right now, but I may be able to find one. If I'm able to find one, I will show you that. Which means that it's, 
if you cannot using everything right here, saying it's well, it looks like my CDF is complicated. I cannot directly solving for the mu and the ET code to put me in the middle. Okay, you still have a hope going back to the equation, this guy and this guy right here, to numerically solving for your lower bound and the upper bound x. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. Okay, so right here it's exactly what I cover right here. Okay, lower bound is this guy and upper bound is this guy. Okay, good. So any question on this? Okay, if not, I'm going to follow some points right here. The first one is, could we actually invert an acceptance region of LRT, for example, to obtain the CI, compass interval, and say it's why? Yes. Okay, but it would be too long for me to talk about here. It may be a good question for your final or for your homework number nine yet. Okay. And then also, can we using pivotal quantity to obtain the constant interval right here, which means is any pivotal quantity other than CDF. Okay, then right here, things become a little bit tricky in the way of what? Let me show you. If I say, well, if I don't know about CDF, Okay, if I say, well, CDF may be not the immediate master I will come to my brain, come to my mind. Then, but I do know, I have, I do know definition of pivotal, I do know definition of a pivotal quantity, which means that it's as long as that quantity having statistics, having parameters, and the whole distribution, independent of it, then I may be able to use that, for example, right here. Number one choice, I would think it's what? Using X1 again, because I think X1 is a good predictor, okay? And X, if I somehow can make anything about X1s, then make a pivot, then I may be able to get another comes interval using little quantity. Right here, see X1's PDF or x one CDF. I think eventually X1 PDF is going to become this. If I'm correct, yeah, I do have that right here. Yeah, yeah, I have that right here. Okay. So X1. PDF. Eventually it's X1 PDF. Eventually, let me see, n e minus n, then y minus me. Then indicator function, mu smaller than uh, y smaller than infinity, which basically is shift the exponential one over n, if you see that, okay? So, not how to imagine if I really shift of mu ends. Then this guy right here say, if I say this is Z, for example, if I say this is Z, for example, then not hard to derive or not hard to imagine. Well, maybe it doesn't mute anymore, okay? Not hard to imagine the Z's, see, the Z's PDF is going to follow exponential one over N. Oh, this is Z, and Z, then indicator function, then Z, then infinity X. Okay, if you see that, then you say, hey, this is what? Independent of mu. So this guy is a pivot, right? So if that guy is a pivot, then I should be able to use saying, the pivotal quantity from A and B, okay, good. And then, because I do know this guy f of z right here, exponential one over n, oh, one over yes. n, yeah. 
So then, then I should be able, then I should be able to what? I should be able to write A and B right here. Okay. For example, I can say, well, exponential n minus one is what? Mm -hmm. It's gamma. Then what? Uh, exponential what? One and then one over n. Right? Okay. So that means I could actually write this gamma right here. And then one, then one over n. That's my quantity, which means that is by notation, this is my gamma. This is my quantity, my quantile, sorry about that, quantile right here. One, one over n, then say, that hand side, okay, I can say it's alpha one. Alpha one right here. And then it's got alpha two right here. And then again, alpha one plus alpha two is alpha. Then this quantile right here is what? Gamma one, one over n, then one minus alpha two is. I can and actually find my a b using quantile notation alpha one small than x one minus mu small than quantile notation one one over n then one minus alpha two it's right i can do so and then if i can write so it's also easy for me to put mu in the middle and then eventually writing down eventually writing down my 95 percent comes in the ball right here it's what x1 actually you will see if i do the operation you will see upper upper bound become lower bound i mean this guy coming from your lower bound because of minus term right here okay that x1 let me see let me let me not make errors Minus x1 minus plus, yeah, that's minus, I think. One, one over n, one minus alpha two. Smaller than mu, bigger than x1 again. x1 first, then plus gamma one, one more n, then alpha one. It's okay. So that also means that it also give me a night one minus alpha comes in the bowl. This is lower bound, then this is up. And look like the comes in the bowl be fine right here. No, it's not. A little bit different, right? I think so. I think so. Mm, although I don't know if, if this quantile actually is the same thing as right here. Maybe you can double check. Um, should be not. Okay. Okay. My class told me that they are not. And it looks like not. Okay. Good. It's also not a comes interval. And maybe remember I told you in the very beginning of the class. See right here. If I can say their parameters is a location family. Then why is the pivot suggested? The pivot suggested is what? X bar minus me. Okay, then is that true right here? Could I actually using X bar? The answer is yes. As, as long as you would be able to deriving the pivots or pivotal quantities distribution, you'll be fine. For example, right here it's, if I say x bar minus mu is actually a pivot, for example, right here, it's for the right here. I say x i is shifted, x i is shifted exponential. So that also means that it's it's not surprising to you to see that x one x i minus mu is going to shift it to exponential. One. So that means I do know x i minus mu follow exponential one right here. Okay. So that means if I put summation on, then become a mu, right? So I put summation x i minus mu become summation x i minus a mu. 
he founds what? Right? Everyone is gamma one one. And then putting summation become gamma. So it's gamma one one. Then putting summation on gamma become n one x. Okay. If I want to divide by n, it's okay. Become x bar minus mu follow. You can say gamma n then one over n. Well, it's also fine. And then because of right hand side gamma, independent of mu. So you will see, yeah, x bar minus mu is a pivot. Then if x bar minus mu is a pivot, then you're just able to write that it from a point pivot to b point, which means quantile to quantile. Right here is what? I got quantile is gamma n one over n. So that means I can write a as what? Gamma notation again, n one of n, left hand side alpha one, then okay and then gamma n one over n right hand side up one minus alpha two x and then by doing so you could also put your mu in the middle bigger smaller become your lower bound x again it's upper bound become lower bound because of minus right here Uh, still minus, right? I think both are minus. Let me let me think. Uh, both are minus. X bar minus plus plus. Yeah, so both are minus actually. So that means this guy right here is minus as well. Because both are positive, then times minus one. Minus as well. Okay. Hey, that give you another concept in the level. Also, one minus the probabilities. Okay, so how many choices do you have right now? You have three choices. So that means in the final, you know my style, right? As long as I have different choices, more than likely I'll asking you which one would you prefer. Okay, then give me your reasons. Okay, to write down which one would you prefer. Okay, again, if I ask in that, please write down something. Even you write down the way that is nice, so I'm going to choose number one. Yes, it's okay, right? Which means that you randomly pick one of them. That could become your criteria as well. I'm not saying it would be wrong, it still be okay, but it's not optimal. That's it. Okay, but don't leave something blank. Okay, if you leave something blank, then I really don't know how to give you points anyway. Okay, again, it's if the interval are different, which one has shorter length then? Okay, then we talk about it uh, before. Oh yeah, I don't talk about it, but I don't mention that before. Then I think this guy possibly give you best slides to talk about. Then if actually you have different options, which one will you prefer? you are going to prefer shorter lens because shorter lens because means higher precision in some sense, right? So for example, if you talk about probabilities, you're not going to tell people that your probability is from zero to one as a compass interval, right? Right. If you see about Donald Trump's uh, approval ratings, you're not going to tell people his approval ratings from zero to one with 95% confidence, right? It doesn't make sense at all. So that means you want to have in that narrow range also have the same confidence, okay? I have the same confidence and they prefer a narrow one. Then basically it's a criteria, it's basically it's intuitive criteria people will use. That also means that it's how do I minimize from A point to B point, or actually how do I minimize from upper bound to lower bound, right? Upper bound minus lower bound, okay? Then there's a theory right here in Kassenberger. I don't have to go to detail, but it's not hard to imagine actually. So if you do have a unit mode in terms of CDF right here, and then if you are choosing any two points, 
So A and B or A prom and the B prom right here. Okay. If you're choosing any points, maybe B point in the right hand side them, it's not really that in the interesting. If you choose any point, I say B point, B prom right here, right? So one interval is A and B. The other interval is A prom and B prom. Okay. This theory told you yeah, that in order to minimize A minus B in terms of distance or range of A minus B is the best way you could have is what? Choosing the identical right here. Okay. Of course, the constraint or the subjected to is what? Your right hand side probability, your left hand side probability plus right hand side probability equals to one. That means from A and B or from A prime, B prime, both to alpha, not one, both to alpha. This constraints got to this constraints got to be satisfied. Under this constraints, the, the theory told you that is you're choosing that the same heights that will minimize your A to B. Okay, good. Okay, so any questions? Of course, right here, if I come back to this, in the final, I will more than likely to asking you deriving everyone's expected length. Everyone's lower bound, upper bound, minus upper bound. Imagine this, imagine that, right? This is, but, this is nothing but what? Expected value, then upper bound, minus lower bound, minus lower bound. Right? The easy stuff, isn't it? Up, X bar going out. So you don't actually worry about random variables in this quotation. It's literally comparing which one is smaller. So that means one minus alpha two gamma quantile. Okay. So that means this one is expected, this one is expected length of this complex interval, right? Then you could do something likewise to the CDF, to the LRT inverted complex interval, then to other pivotal quantile interval as well using X ones, okay? So this is exactly a question, this is exactly a question I like to ask in a final. Not difficult to compute, okay? And then you imagine, then you need to find out which one has shorter lens among all the competing ones. Okay, good. So any questions on this before I move on? Okay, if not, I'm going to move on to the next one, which also really critical because as you can see it, I like asymptotics because it's easy to handle, because it's more straightforward, and because it's more intuitively to find something. But in the meantime, it's in order to use asymptotics, you need to sacrifice something because your n may be not large enough. Okay? So like like in meter number two, it's so at the final question of meter number two. Some of you actually give me a asymptotic confidence in not it. Some, some people, some of you give me asymptotic testing. I just feel like, well, one side is feel sorry for with that because I actually asking for an exact test. In the meantime, I also feel happy about it because you guys reflect, you know, you guys are really smart, a genius in some way. I don't know where that come from. I haven't teached that yet, but you guys can use it. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you could maybe you guys don't have to come to my class, right? So 
Okay, good. Coming back to this. Sorry about that. So, uh, really, as I said in the beginning of the class, in my class, you do need to tell one is exact, one is approximate. Okay? The same thing right here. You will have exact distribution. You, has, you will have a symptomatic distribution. Using that, you, you, you would be able to construct it in the distribution and the asymptotic distribution, for example, right here. So if you could actually write down deriving from something, you can exactly write down that guy is equals to one minus alpha. Then that's exact comes interval, okay? Then if you somehow need to use in central limit theory or using any asymptotic theories, to show that, to, to derive the comes interval, that means it's a passing limit, as well as you are not actually having exactly one minus alpha. You only have that approximate one minus alpha. Okay, then right here, I want you to think, okay, really, and, my question right here. If x1 to xn is id followed normality right here. Okay? So if the comfort interval for mu could be this guy right here. Okay? This guy exact or approximate. The answer is exact. Why that is exact? not approximate, ask yourself, if I do have x1 to xn, is I ID normal? Does my x bar minus mu divided by s, uh, let me see, square root of n right here. What distribution this guy is? Okay, if this guy right here, in this example, exactly follow n t n minus one. That means that one is exact distribution. So using exact using the exact distribution to derive the constant interval, now this guy right here, you could write down exactly one minus alpha equals to that quantile. So let me show you right here because I don't want to really having that. Right there. So, because you can write exact one minus alpha probability of I do have middle part as my pivotal quantity. I do know that pivotal quantity is from t n minus one. Say okay, divided by alpha, then t n minus one then one minus half over two, okay. Because I, I do know this guy follow t and minus one minutes. So from this point to this point, based on t distribution, inside guy exactly equals to one minus alpha. So this guy's equal, not approximate. So hence, the comes the interval you have right here, Okay, it's an exact distribution. Okay, good. So that means exact compass interval. How about next one? The same thing right here. The same thing right here. Okay, the same thing right here. How about for sigma square? Okay, so does this guy right here? exact approximate. The answer is exact as well. Because again, it's, you do know I can write one minus alpha equals probability. I do know if you remember that as well. You remember it's m minus one x squared divided by sigma squared. Follow the distribution. Exactly chi squared m minus one x. Okay, so that means this guy right here, it's bigger chi square m 
minus one say alpha one, then chi squared m minus one say one minus alpha two, for example. I do know that by chi squared from A to B exactly equals to one minus alpha. So hence that the P, the compass interval deriving from exact distribution is exact compass interval. Okay, good. Keep going. Say if I do have x1 to xn is but nearly sigma. Okay. And then you will know that it's MLE is X bar. Okay. So so according to central limit theory, again, central limit theory, central limit theory tells you what? Central limit theory tells me root n x bar minus e x one going to D, then normal, then zero, then variance of x1 is this is a formation i teach about central limit theory okay so that means ex1 right here is theta variance x1 right here is sigma square as well as equals to what variance of Bernoulli, nothing but theta times one minus theta is right here okay so that means, based on central based on central limit theory, I do know. Based on central limit theory, I do know root n, then x bar minus theta divided by square root of variance of x one right here goes to d, then normal zero one. Nothing but just put my theta. Or I'm going to say that into my denominator becomes square root. Okay. So because I know so, because I do know that when n is large enough, the quantity right here is going to become normal and normal again. That means right hand side independent of theta, isn't it? Which tells you that it's as long as n is large enough, this guy becomes pivotal quantity okay that means if i do know that that's a pivotal quantity when n is really large right because i do know that n is large let's because i do know that when n is large this guy going to follow like like the normality is, or behave like normality is. That means as long as n is large, I can definitely treat the probability inside guy right here, one minus alpha, I can definitely using these quantile. Over two, then up to alpha over two. Okay, so this guy, let me put more consistent notation. I want to one minus alpha, I want to middle minus z one minus alpha over two then z one minus alpha over two x right quantile to quantile become one minus alpha however key point is that this one only occurs in or when n is very really large so it's not actually equals to probability as one minus alpha it's actually approximate. Making sense? When n is small, the whole quantity not necessarily normal, right? It still follows some Bernoulli trial in terms of x bar things. The probability is that discrete sense. Okay? Then when n is large enough, then this kind of normality pops out. So that means is the probability not actually equals to one minus alpha by one minus alpha. Of course, you argue that it's really large. Of course, this guy would be more and more closer to the one minus alpha. But by mathematical notation, we feel more safe about just writing it down. Quinn, uh, approximation is by doing so, you will find out it's easy to operate. But not in this case, right? So right here, it's 
Okay, another point right here I want to mention also a trick to play as well. So, right here, you will find out it. The ultimate goal is putting theta in the middle, right? Like we did for any comes interval. It. But imagine using the whole thing right here. I will give you some seconds to take a look. Is that really easy to put your theta in the middle? Could you actually shift it? Could you actually shift this guy to left hand side, to right hand side? And doing bunch of upper work, right? Okay. So luckily, because you know about syntactics, you know about something about a syntactic distribution you would also remember this guy right here also behave like a normal zero one it if i say this guy by central limit theory this guy goes to normal zero one okay then you should be remember you should remember this guy also goes to normal zero one based on what theory remember that based on slasky theory because x bar goes to p then theta as well as so-called continuous mapping theory not on all about slasky also continuous mapping theory as well but by any means it's the result is intuitive I plug in consistent dimension on theta, then my asymptotic distribution about normalities doesn't change, which is a good thing. Why is a good thing? If you look at this quantity right here, so much easier to put theta in the middle because I can actually operate this guy right here to left hand side, to right hand side, divided by square root of n, then I'll do some operation on the sides. And then eventually I can get down it. Let me see if I can write it down smoothly right here. But I don't have space, so pardon me unless, let me take this out because it's long on both ends. I think eventually it will become still x bar. I think it will be plus, right? Might be minus. Let's write down minus and double check on the solution. I will see what happened. Minus, I bet would be upper side become lower bound. Upper bound become lower bound. Da, 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 da. Let me see. Da, 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 da. Minus, minus. Yeah, I think so. Okay, good. And then right here will become this guy, I guarantee is this. Okay, and then smaller than theta. Then this guy right here, it's x bar plus, uh, yeah, plus z minus o one. Then square root x bar minus x bar. Then square root of n right here. Then this guy become that. Okay, so that means this guy is lower bound. Theta in the middle. This guy it's upper. It. Okay, so easy to operate. Okay, in this case, so I think eventually it become right here. Okay, then again, it's why this guy is not exact comes interval. It's a passing may comes interval. It's because you don't have exact probability at the very beginning. You only have a at the beginning. Okay, good, good, great. If that's somehow acceptable, let me talk about one more thing, which may be confusing to you. If you don't understand it, it's fine. But I would think you might want to think about it a bit. As I say right here, I say using this guy right here, it's not easy to do operation. You will get something right here, say that in the middle. Okay, I say so. But does that mean I cannot find 
from lower bound to upper bound satisfy this kind of inequality yet? For example, if I taking they have they have hand side right here. If I taking this inequality right here, would they are somehow give me possibility I would find anything small than something that actually satisfy this inequality? The answer is no. The answer is sorry, I should say so. No means no, no means you can find it. Okay. So again, I'm sorry about the double negative. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is you can actually using this inequality to searching for every theta that satisfy their inequalities and you will find out it's actually having some upper bound sense. Okay, that means you find every theta, every theta satisfy this inequality, then more likely you will find something upper bound right here. This guy's right here, the theta, all satisfy this inequality. Okay. Likewise, using this side right here, okay, you could also find something having that lower bound, having a lower bound, and then everything say that right here, satisfy the right hand side inequalities, the second inequalities. Then you do your intersection, you could be able to find lower bound and the upper bound. Eventually, all those points in the middle, lower bound, upper bound, all these points, right? All these points are intersections here, okay? Are intersections right here. Those guys, those say guys, exactly satisfy your lower bound and upper bound, and also satisfy these both inequalities. Their one is also, a 95, a one minus alpha comes in the So that means that doing this guy right here give you easy comes interval because you can do easy operations, shifting left hand side, right hand side, and it got theta in the middle. You solve the equation. But it doesn't mean you cannot using this guy right here to get comes interval of theta. Just you need work. Just you need more numerical approximation methods to find that all the theta between lower bound and upper bound that satisfy both inequality. Okay, hope that making sense to you. If not, I'm, I would say it's okay. But you wanna, I want you to think about it. Why I say so? Why is they? You don't have to do this. Okay, of course, doing this much easier, much too easy to operate. It more than likely will be appears in your final exam because I, I want you to do operations easily, okay? But in reality, you don't have to use this interval, okay? Although it's easy to compute, okay? And then in the meantime, you'll be curious which one actually give you more optimal comes interval, okay? It's open questions, I'll let you to think, okay? Good. Only four minutes left is perfect ending for this. Okay, so for the next week, I'm going to talk about uh, large sample properties of MLEs. Again, that's my strength because I doing MLE, I do large sample theory all the time. So then, hopefully, that making sense to you. And then, our final is going to cover uh, everything. Does uh, to cover everything? Uh, cover the large sample property of MLE as well, which means that it's the final exam is going to cover anything. I would uh, final exam is going to cover anything I'm going to teach next week. Okay, good. So, okay, so right here I meant to say it. Although I talked about exact, exact, and then approximate comes to the interval, but by saying exact comes to the interval. Sometimes it doesn't exactly having one minus alpha 
probability. The reason is not surprising. The reason for that is, imagine your discrete, discrete distribution is, okay? Even though you could find that, for example, even though you could find that pivot, Tx right here, okay? You've been seeing me writing down so much about this, right? Quantile to quantile, A to B, quantile to quantile, right here, okay? It's about, again, I say, if you can write equal means exact, but the point is, what if your Tx is actually binomial? Or saying that, oh, not say Tx, sorry about that, maybe Tx is confusing, Qx, Because Ts is the x as well as the mu right here, say that right here. How about write this? More like a pivotal quantity notation. Okay. What if your pivotal quantity actually, for example, follow binomial? Okay. Imagine distribution of binomial is no matter how you choose your A point to B point, right? The probability not going to become Something like that, okay? No matter how you choose from A point to B point, okay? The probability between A point to B point, for example, all those probability, even you sum them together, they are not going to exact equals to one minus alpha, isn't it? Right? The same thing happens to, let me talk about level alpha test, remember that? So by any combination of probabilities, your probability not exactly equals to one minus alpha. But in that case, we'll still call that as exact distribution because they're based on exact. Uh, they are still call it exact times the interval, I'm tired. So exact times the interval because based on exact distribution. It's, okay? So, but, so binomial is that case. Also, a more common case is what? Poisson distribution. Even Poisson distribution, you still have that discrete and variable, discrete distribution. So from A to B, not exactly equals to one minus alpha, but we still call it exact distribution. Exact comes in the ball. Sorry about that. Okay, it's four, it's 145 right now. I I I want to stop here, stop here because I'm going to prepare my presentation. Okay. So any questions on on this? You guys still there, right? <laughs> no question at all? I have a question, Professor. Yes. Yeah, uh, I think on slides 18, there was 18. a notation, I wasn't sure. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me go to 18 first. Yes, right here. Mm -hmm. uh, 18, uh, for integral, the range of integral, uh, yeah. could you explain why there's no? <laughs> yeah. Only I can explain it. So inside guy, I really just want to create PDF, a CDF. Inside guy is CDF, PDF. This is not CDF, okay? So the range integral reach as I saying it, the X itself would have in that something to something. Okay, so from A to B, right? By any means is A to B, right? So I, I think you're asking it, how I know A is lower bound, how I know A is, so first of all, it's, I do know, I do, I do know, I do know I need to using upper bound to find something. Make sense? Mm -hmm. I know that, right? Right here. Right? I do know I don't need to using alpha one to find upper bound. Okay? So the point is, hold on. Let me take a breath a bit. So, okay. So the point is, how do I know which one to which one is? Right? Actually, how do I know A and B? Right? Mm -hmm. You stuck with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, 
only thing I can explain it because if you're going back to the graph I draw, let me see, let me, I can draw it here. Imagine you do have decreasing function of theta and then PDF. Actually, I need to think about it. I do know using low upper bound to find it, but why I can say is from, um, uh, I think basically is that. So probability of A to B, alpha over two, let's write down alpha one, or maybe that, okay, hold on. PDF. Okay. So I do need to know I want to using what? I want to da, 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 da. I want to using this guy right here to define lower bound. We talk about upper bound, right? I do know I want using this guy at uh, the upper bound. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So then in terms of CDF, how do I really know that I need to using no how do I know that I need to put upper bound right here? That's the question, right? Yeah, and also why is y to the instant? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's likewise. Yeah. Yeah. So let me uh, I I remember one time I think about it, so I forget how to explain that in this case though. Uh but it's a good point to think about why it's from low. I think it's come from, I think coming from less, right? This guy right here is if, yeah. Let's think of mathematically then. If I do have that, then that means, I actually I'm trying to solving for the, the equation, I think. Right, CDF right here is nothing but taking integral on the PDF, right? And then I'm solving for equation that one bigger than F of right here. And then I also know that I say that I got to become what you solved. Oh, let me let me stop recording first. I don't want to put the record.